Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'd like to welcome today very, very special guest, Richard Bowden, who's head of estates at Blenheim Palace. Now, um, you may be aware, if you're a regular visitor to Blenheim, that in fact, the Grand Bridge is closed at the moment. And it's probably the first time in its 300 year history that it's been closed. So you can't actually cross the lake at that point. And the man whose fault it is, or at least who I'm going to point blame at, or point the finger at, is um, Richard. So um, welcome, Richard. So what's happening? Why have you closed our bridge? Thank you, Antonia. Well, of course, as with lots of um, the stru built structure at Blenheim, it's been around for 300 plus years and it just needs a little bit of TLC at the moment. And whilst it's um, blocked off for now and um, pedestrian routes are restricted and vehicle routes are restricted, it's in its lifespan. It's a very small period of time that we interfere with the flow of traffic over it. But um, yes, it's um, yeah necessary repair. OK, well, I think, Richard, before you tell us exactly what's going on there, um, and there's no better person to, to describe what's going on, let's have a, just a little look at the history of the bridge. Now, um, I hope you can see in front of you a, um, a sketch of Woodstock Manor. So before building started on the palace in 1705, um, on the site, which is kind of opposite the lake, um, or sorry, across from the lake, stood Woodstock Manor. And this had been hit here for hundreds of years before the palace started uh, to be built. And when the Queen gave the first Duke of Marlborough the money and the land to build Blenheim, that's what was already there in situ. And the architect of Blenheim Palace, John Bambra, as you know, was very keen to retain this. It wasn't in terribly good repair, but he thought it would make a rather attractive feature. Um, but he'd kind of reckoned without the first Duchess, Duchess Sarah. And although he kind of had it slightly renovated so that he could live in it while the work was being carried out on the palace, Sarah found out about it and she ordered that it be knocked to the ground. And Richard, you'll be able to tell me whether this is correct or not, but I've always been led to believe that the rubble and the stone from Woodstock Manor was used to build the foundations for the bridge. Is that right? Well, I've heard that as well, but we, we haven't found evidence in the foundations because luckily the bridge's macro structure is in good condition, so we've not had to venture that deep. But certainly within the built structure and at certain levels within the bridge, there are... Um, carved detailed stones that predate the bridge so it's the, okay. the first bit of reuse rather than recycling so there, <laughs> there are definitely stones from the right era in the bridge um, we've been I've been very lucky to be in and out of the bridge quite a bit in, in looking at the structure which we'll go through in a bit but yeah. Um, I've um, yeah we took a dele some delegates from historic England and it's interesting having different eyes looking at a uh, at a structure so we found a number of more, more of these stones in areas that weren't known previously um, there is a chap who's doing some research into these stones and recording them for us so hopefully once we've been through the bridge with a fine tooth comb we'll have a, a true record of what has been used wow. um, so yes very interesting and yes a little bit of folklore is actually coming true I think so it's lovely Excellent. so I can carry on saying that in complete confidence so <laughs> that's what predated the bridge um, and then we're going to have a, a look at a picture of um, how the bridge would have stood because although there's this amazing lake there now before it was just spanning the river Glyme I believe and um, you can see that it, it didn't really look as quite as amazing as it does today. Yes, it was a very different setting, I think. And this is looking west to Woodstock, I assume, a little bit of an artist impression with the, the, the church in the, in the background. But you can see that through the main arch of the bridge as well, you can see where there was a, a causeway or a cascade mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's talk the, um, the palace as we know it today is up to the right hand side of this image, um, yeah, to the south of the bridge. 
and to the north is where the um, Woodstock Manor would have been. And right. it's reported that there were two causeways, one going off towards London and Oxford and one going off towards Old Woodstock. So the, perhaps the one we're seeing um, represented in this picture is um, the cascade that then was formed from the original um, causeway. Right, um, that's okay. The, the details of this, are, yeah, it's very different to, to what we're seeing. So the water level at the moment in this image is, is considerably lower, I guess, as if one and a half metres lower than we see at the moment. So, yes, it's had a, a, a very distinct life, this bridge. Yes, well, and, and also a very distinct setting. And, and again, if we go to our next slide, you, know, you mentioned artistic licence, or in this case, it's an artist's impression of what happened next. Um, and this was in 1764, Capability Brown was employed. He was commissioned to landscape uh, the park. Um, and you can see, uh, again, um, a representation of the bridge and how the lake was created. Um, and it involved sheep, which I always find quite amusing. <laughs> I assume it didn't involve sheep. I think they probably involved themselves. Um, uh, no, no, no. They used the sheep to puddle the clay. Apparently. Oh, did they? Yeah, oh, yeah. Fantastic. Apparently it was a, a, a known technique. Um, and you can see the barrow runs. But again, it's incredible to think of that lake. And, and I'm afraid I don't know how many acres it covers. Um, I, I, I don't either. But all hand dug and yes. as, this, as this portrays moved out is by cart. It's amazing, isn't it? It is absolutely incredible. And then eventually the bridge was given its proper setting. Um, but again, before we look at it as it is today, it, it wasn't exactly how Vanbrugh had planned, was it? No, it's a far plainer um, version of the Grand Bridge as we see it today. But yes, there was an intention for a colonnade to go above, so signified by E in this um, image. But it's um, we're not sure whether that was a colonnade that was going to be open to the elements or whether it was going to be um, had a roof had to have a roof to it. But um, yes, the, the meagre three stories of the bridge at the moment would have had a fourth story, and then also the decorative embellishments, um, at, at the column heads would have been rather. Yeah, a, a rather um, more gra even more grand appearance. Um, it's amazing to think of this very, very grand bridge is is incomplete. Yeah. I, I I did upset our um, our heritage um, committee because I just had a suggestion that perhaps we look to recreate and install the bridge as it was intended. <laughs> However, I think the costs are far too prohibitive and it's actually it, it's a grand and massive structure as it is. And to increase it and extend it would be, be wrong at this time, I think. But what a vision of Amber there. It's just an amazing but, structure. But you did recreate it, didn't you? Virtually, yes. <laughs> so for some of the interpretation, which is around the work that we're doing at the moment, we had yeah, uh, an image of what it would have a sort of uh, yeah a feel of what it might have felt like if it was there now so this is an, uh, the photograph was taken um, um late last year i think um or in the summer last year and this was added to it by our architects just to give us an idea and a, a little bit of a look at grand bridge of course there's another stage that the water level as we said before would have been a meter and a half below so even um in vanbrugh's time before um, capability brown it would have been even more impressive imposing structure and less of a waterway and richard well, two things i i had kind of i have been asked at various stages if this is what the work is that we're actually going to create this top structure because as you say this photographs on the hoarding um, and i've kind of reassured people that no we're not but what's, what's your preference? Do you prefer this or do you prefer the bridge as it stands at the moment? I, I think both are incredibly grand, but I think I think the addition of a colonnade and um, the embellishments above, I think, would be even too grand for Ble Blenheim setting. I think, I think it's fine as it is. We should just repair it as it currently stands rather than try to um, put it into Vanbrugh's original design. Okay. Um, yeah, 
<laughs> it's, I mean, it, it, the next slide, we're looking at exactly what we've got. So we've had a 3D survey undertaken of the bridge inside and out, um, including from drones, from boats, and from, um, yeah, so it's deployed survey equipment. So MK Surveys did this survey a couple of years ago now. Um, and it's what we're basing all our repairs and um, and contracting, yeah, all, all the sort of tendering documents based on the, this this data. Um, and it's quite an amazing place, the bridge, because um, if we go to our next slide, it shows that there there are just there are spaces within the bridge. It's not just a solid mass. There are spaces which the the, the boring building surveyor in me sees as construction voids that perhaps it helped with how they built the bridge um, and it's cheaper to build an empty space than fill it up with stone and whilst the Woodstock Manor would have been a large source of stone the, the bridge itself is just so colossal that the volume of stone needed to fill these gaps would have been massive however as we look there's um, th this is a, a simplified floor plan and this is the upper level so this is directly below the tarmac level you right. can walk along these tunnels so to the the south which is on the right hand side of the picture in that sort of peach color and um, you can enter into there and walk along the corridors and then pop out in the towers with those lovely round oh. rooms and looking out over that way to woodstock and the yeah. other side to the east um, and then the three sort of lobes, the left hand side there, are as it springs into the arch of the bridge, you've got structures. So in the very middle of the bridge, it disappears to know, probably just a metre or so of construction and not a lot else. So there's no room and no way of walking between the two halves. Um, oh, gosh. So, yes, quite amazing. I mean, the access to the bridge as it stands at the moment. Bear in mind, we don't know what the access internally would have been. Perhaps originally when it was just the river Glyme, the access would have been by foot alongside the Glyme and into the main, under the main arch. Now it's far less dignified and we've got a manhole to, in the um, edge of the tarmac up on the top of the bridge to enter the peach side and the green side we enter from by boat and by a, a gate at the bottom, which if we go to the next slide, it's, it's shown on there. So at the bottom of the stairwell on the left-hand side, it's a green arrow showing where we can oh. pop, in, pop into the bridge and then up the stairwell to the left hand or north side and then it takes you to the layer we've just seen oh right okay so this is sort of indicating about water level um and here we've got in the orange we've got a uh, we can get access through the main towers and into the space we'll show you some images of this a little bit later um the other side however is where it says water in blue is a submerged room where we've got um, the remains of a couple of old boats underwater and submerged in the silt and also quite an exciting um, bat population. And then to the right of that, you've got the, um, going um, east-west, you've got the um, archway of the bridge. And then to the side of that, the pink section is a yes. submerged area which we found um, whilst doing some of the surveys. So it's, yeah, the bridges keep, keep um, providing us with um, insights into its construction and perhaps its social history. Um, yeah, so if you go to the next slide, it just shows areas that we can't really get to because it's at water level or below. So um, the pink areas to the left are below the water level. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's definitely rooms there and you can see the ceiling structure um, and the sort of window structures that have been blocked up. Um, uh, but there's only, I don't know, a, a metre or so of airspace there and then two metres or so of um, submerged room. And then to the other side, the water, the water, um, the, the boat area is again underwater still and um, yeah, submerged and mainly silt actually. Yeah. Because, of course, during the 300 years of the bridge's existence and um, a couple of hundred years being submerged in the lake, it has collected a fair amount of silt as has Queen Pool. So, yes, quite so a Richard, when eventually we dredged the lake, because um, we, we were due to do it last year, weren't we, or, or start work on it last year. Um, yeah. So will when we do do it, will those chambers become accessible or...? Um, they might be in the short term. They certainly won't be long term accessible, but um, we will yeah. it, uh, we will need to explore the bridge structure below water and below silt um, just to check on the 
um, structural condition. So um, the bridge as a whole is in fairly good condition because mm -hmm. the whole sort of major structure of it is fine. There's no evidence of settlement or subsidence or anything. And it's been there a long time and it's a massive structure. It's just there's, there's local wants of repair around the bridge, um, mainly due to water ingress mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, just general decay over the 300 years. But it doesn't seem to be a problem with it being submerged in the water. Um, I say that just with my fingers crossed, hoping that <laughs> when we take the silt away, we're not going to find some horrors, but I'm not yeah. expecting to um, because there's no evidence of that above water. Um, the lake project, as you say, has been delayed um, partly due to um, availability of um, contractors due to COVID and all the constraints at the moment. But we're also looking at um, the procurement process and seeing whether we change from a wet or from a, sorry, a dry dredge to a wet dredge and how that all pans right. out will will change how we approach the bridge. But I'll come to the sort of stages of looking at the bridge below water a bit later. But it's, um, yeah, it'll be amazing to see it with, um, yeah, in its, all its glory as well, without the silt around it. Um, Sorry, have you any idea how deep the fire, I mean, it, it, for it not to have moved and for it to have its feet in water like this for all these years, um, it, it must have pretty deep foundations or did they not build foundations as such in, in those days? Well, um, I can't really answer that exactly, but we know yeah. that the, the bedrock is quite, quite shallow in, at that point. Um, so we imagine that it's founded directly onto bedrock which may okay. be, I mean, maybe one or two, one or two metres below water level. So sort of two and a half metres but um, mm -hmm. down maybe, but there'll be, um, we found, we'll be in bedrock. We've done a little bit of probing around and um, the going through the silt, it becomes very hard, very quickly. So one would imagine that it's just found it straight onto the rock. So that's why it's so stable and being a massive structure, it's great. Okay. Um, shall I move on to the next slide? Yes, if you would. So the internal structures, as we said, are, uh, actually are, are in my building surveyor's head, see them as construction voids, as I've said, and cheap to build, but they have been finished in some places incredibly well. So not only have we got the, the coarse rubble stone of the ceiling here, we've also got coin stones and um, detailed um, cut ashlar blocks of the archway. And then coarse rubble stone again in, in sort of the, the vertical element. So there's been a lot of time, effort and, and money spent on the bridge. And for lots of areas not to be seen, it's very, yeah, it, it's quite amazing, really. It's a um, lot of effort, isn't it, to, 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 you know, just create a space that is of no use if that's the, the purpose behind it. Yes, and um, it's... It, it would be very surprising to me that it was built without the thought of being used in some way, even if it is, um, I mean, architecturally, um, to, to um, provide symmetry is often a, a thing that's carried out, especially with window reveals and things. And certainly in the bridge, it's a bit strange in places. Some of the windows or openings are at the sort of ground level of the room. So they're, they're obviously not designed to be... Um, yeah, be sort of normal rooms with um, window sills and things. It's just, it is a little strange. Um, the rooms that are in the towers are a little bit more conventional. Mm -hmm. And there are some evidence of fireplaces and chimneys going up on the edge of the towers. Right. And that's at both levels that we can see and probably so, un under the water as well. So, yeah, I think it was intended in areas to be inhabited in some form. It's interesting what you said about the windows being at ground level, um, because you see that in some of the rooms in the palace as well. Um, on the, I think it's at the mezzanine floor where you have the circular windows. Um, and in what used to be my old office, my very first office when I came to work at Blenheim, the window was circular. And to look out of it, you had to kneel on the floor. You know, so... Perhaps this was something of Ambrose, perhaps that's where the servants would have been carrying out whatever they were meant to be doing if the chambers were being used by the family, who knows? Yeah, it, it certainly wouldn't have been um, for family use, I wouldn't have thought with the, no. yeah, the windows in those positions. And yes, it's either back to my boring construction voids or it is the um, yeah, use of the servants or 
or, or storage or something, but it's a huge building, three-story building to have so close to the palace yet not linked. There've been stories of being tunnels and things linking the two, but unfortunately we've not found any evidence of that yet. We're hopeful, but um, <laughs> yes, we. who knows? Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just strange. And also the, the there isn't a, for want of a better term, a ducal access into the bridge at the moment. Um, perhaps right. there was, and there has been areas that have been bricked and blocked up in the past. So it would have been quite, it has evolved over time and been um, uh, altered perhaps, but um, as to when, who or why, I don't know at the moment. And I'm not sure we ever will, but it, I think that sort of adds to the mystery really. It's quite, yeah. quite amazing. So this is an image that we're looking at here is quite close up in, in one of the, in, in the wet room with the boats submerged. And if we'd go to the next slide, this is looking the, the other side and the other way. So this tunnel runs with the carriageway of the bridge. Mm -hmm. In front of us is the sort of green light of the tunnel that runs east to west, which is the archway of the bridge, the wet archway. Right. Um, and yeah, this is a, yeah, this is one of the amazing cavernous rooms. But bearing in mind, we've got, I don't know, I can't remember what I said, I think it's a metre or so of water and then silt build up. The proportions of the room are very tall and then, mm. Um, fairly narrow. I mean, they're huge. I'm sure my house would easily fit into this, um, the entire house. But yes, it's the proportions are, are very strange in this place. But you would imagine that there would be a use for it. The tunnel, little tunnel going off to the left. There are in fact four chambers off this main chamber, all wet, all of which have got yeah domed roofs, mm -hmm. domed ceilings, and uh, just yeah very well constructed yet I can't see a use or a purpose for them. There must have been because they're huge spaces. Um, Richard, what did, I know you said that, um, you know, there, there's also the theory that it's it's cheaper to build a, a hollow bridge, as it were. But I can understand that if it hadn't got all these beautiful, you know, I mean, it's they're works of art in themselves. So surely that must have been expensive in terms of labour and skill and craftsmanship. Um, you know, wouldn't it have been cheaper just to bung stone in it and, you know, get um, on with it? Yes, there's also talk that perhaps it was um, in places a bit of a test piece for apprentice um, oh, okay. masons and things. So, so you sort of, if you can prove yourself in the bridge, you can work on the palace. I'm not sure how true that is because a lot of the, the, the stone detailing here is very different to the palace, but it's, right. um, there are some transferable skills, shall we say. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure really. And it's, um, I think that's part of the mystery of the bridge really is we don't quite know. Certainly spaces in the bridge have been used in the past for um, pumping water up to the palace. Um, and when there was the um, systems in the Flagstaff um, tower that water was pumped from the lake from within the bridge up to the tower. So yes, it's certainly evolved and changed, changed over time, but um, yeah, the biggest difference being that Vanbrugh's flooding, I think. Yes. Yes, if we go to the next image, is actually the other extreme. So the corresponding side of the bridge, we've got an area, not only is this being constructed with good stonework, it's also been plastered. Yeah. And this plaster is just in fantastic condition, considering it's just been left fairly derelict for hundreds of years it is really fantastic there is um evidence throughout of um its sort of former glory so around the arch in the middle there are you i, I can see because i've been there but you can see potholes the holes where um the um sort of the, the timber probably um oh, was nice. installed around the archway so perhaps there was a lovely door set very large door set because again this side we, we were on made up ground which we think was put in here in the 50s but we're not entirely sure um where the ground level outside would have been far lower mm -hmm. so again a very tall and thin opening okay quite large by modern standards but not by the the palace's standards so it's interesting and also the cornice all the way around between the sort of darker um 
uh, plaster and the light of plaster of yes. the ceiling is um has obviously been removed um and so it must have been fantastic in here mm -hmm. so this then uh, somewhat blows my theory of them all being construction voids out of the water because this the level of detail and the expense to plaster this area is just yeah it it would have been a huge undertaking mm -hmm. only just just building a three-story bridge um so perhaps here there was entertaining spaces of some form excellent but i'm not sure we have any records of any but it's just just interesting i think i i prefer that theory to the um you know economy um sort of theory i like to think of them retiring <laughs> there on a hot summer's afternoon in the shade yes it would have been an amazing space and it's incredibly the internal environment is relatively stable except where we've got a few leaks and a few bits it's it's dry it stays at a fairly constant temperature throughout the year so it feels cool in the um summer and relatively warm in the winter so it's um yeah and with the condition of this plaster it just shows us it's fairly stable so it's not going through a heating corner because it's such a massive structure again yeah wow so the next image is from this um from that the large plastered room looking out um i'm pretty sure this is looking out to the um east from that room right. and into the bottom of the eastern tower but it might be the west it's um difficult to see because it, it depends where the light sources come from and and spaces because the, the, those elements are almost symmetrical but there's a sort of hint of a fireplace perhaps at the back of that shot yes and actually round to the left right. which you can't see in the shadow um we had um an image taken under the water where we think there might have been a um a another fireplace of sorts which has perhaps got a kitchen range in so wow. i'm really looking forward to when the water level comes down if it does for the lake dredge of actually being able to get in there and have a look and see what's what's sort of around the corners and see what it is again these areas are all plastered above the water level unfortunately below water level the debris you can see through the ever so clear water because there's no direct link to the lake it must just filter through small gaps in the stone or things so it's incredibly still in there but through there you can see the sort of remnants of the plaster that's fallen off the wall and floated floated to debris in the bottom but it's yeah it's really interesting and yes yeah, this this side of me i'm sure this side was used or certainly intended to be used but again, right. it's back to how would you get access? And it's all underwater now. So one would assume it was, yeah, it was part of Vambra's original design to enter these areas by the edge of the blind, perhaps. I think I, I've seen, um, it, you know, and they are just engravings from before the lake was created. And the lower arches kind of had little steps um, leading up to them. So I don't know, it, but again, I don't know how accurate those are. You know, no, they're not photographs, they're, they're sketches. No, we've seen the images, but we haven't found evidence. Um, ah, okay. But there's, there's also um, a theory that perhaps the outside of the outside skin of the bridge was um, wrapped prior to them flooding it. So there seems to be a sacrificial course of stone on the outside, which right. is um, relatively thin and it's relatively separate from the bridge. So it's not, so it's toothed into the stonework all the way and part of the structure, it looks like it's been a sort of a sheet of, of um, stone added to it. But again, we, we're not entirely sure. And we'll, yeah, find out more as we progress through looking I, after this bridge. I find it staggering. I mean, I, I'm not a builder. I don't have an engineer, as, as you will have guessed, don't have any sort of background in that. But to think that, this was done hundreds of years ago without the use of the, the tools and the machines that we have today. Um, and if they kind of then put this extra, um, as you say, this sacrificial layer on the outside. It must have been a huge job to do all that manually. Yeah, massive undertaking, not least finding the stone. Whilst we do have stone, uh, have quarries in and around the estate none of them are of the size or or the stone of the quality that's 
needed to provide to build the palace or the bridge mm. so they'll have had to bought the stone distances and that's just amazing the logistics yeah. it's hard enough these days bringing stone in um with all the mechanized mechanization and um road links but it's um yeah it must have been yeah a, a huge logistical undertaking and I think inc incredibly expensive and by barge and cart and goodness no and slow i mean what a slow undertaking as well Yes, you want to make sure you get the right stone, don't you? Oh, definitely. <laughs> it would never do to get the wrong, would it? <laughs> Indeed not. But uh, the um, yes, you you see that it's um, it's it stayed there fairly much intact for three hundred years. So they they certainly got it right. The engineering's right, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, should we look at the next slide? Good, yes. Yes, so, so within the bridge, this is back to the, the, the wet room and the bits we were looking at before, but we have some very exciting um, and very ecologically um, important habitats within the bridge because of the stable environment, because it's over water. We have in these um, uh, chambers off the main room, we have um, a maternity roost of Dorbenton bats who which are very um yeah locally abundant in the bridge but i think nationally rare so they're very wow. uh, a very important um species to look after and certainly with working looking at the lake we are going and dredging it if we do um reduce the water level significantly we, we will falsify the water level in this area so we'll dam this area and keep pumping water in because the bats are so important and not only are they protected but they're also um yeah they're, they're part of the bridge bridge's current life really and throughout the bridge we've got um ideal habitats for bats so there's lots of um bat roosts and hibernating bats so and um, all the access within the bridge which is very limited um is under the watchful guise of the um ecologists and making sure that we protect the habitats of the bats around because you can inadvertently if you're too noisy or introducing too much heat you can quite easily disturb them which is um certainly not in our interest at all yeah. so yeah a lot of constraints to work around a bridge not only is it a three-story massive structure but it's got it's got very unique ecology it's also over water and there's lots of lots of tricky bits with the bridge but it's yeah absolutely amazing richard is there a time of year that um is a more sensitive period than others for the bats um yes i think hibernation time so in the colder weather yeah it's far more important not to disturb the bats and also at that um i don't know whether you, i don't know what you call it but sort of at breeding time so when mm -hmm. the um young are present it's also very important to stay away i mean i've been very spoiled i spent a, a night not in this area but the archway that's behind the, the photographer here um out in the lake and um, with thermal imaging cameras and we watched the bats come out oh wow all around go off foraging and then come back to their roosts so it's quite amazing so we we are recording and, and monitoring the bats in in the bridge as well as other ecology as well and, and they're happy <laughs> they haven't complained about the work that's going on there at the moment certainly not no they are happy it's again it's the bridge is such a massive structure that you're far enough away from the hibernating bats in this case mm -hmm. so you're not going to cause a problem i mean i've been in the bridge and had articulated lorries rumble over the top and i you didn't hear it or feel it in the bridge you could see the the, the reflection in the water in the yeah. lake but you couldn't feel them so it's yeah it's okay. it's a massive structure so now they they're well looked after well, which, which leads me to ask, you know, well, we'll come on to it, why you're actually carrying out the work if it's such a, you know, it's so sound. But before we, we go on and look at that, so you found bats in the bridge. What else have you found in your in your little probings? Yes, we found lots of evidence of people who've been in there before. Um, and I think graffiti is a little bit... Um, of an interesting concept but certainly we've got signatures that are in the bridge there are quite a few like like this one which is looks to be from 1758 or 1750 perhaps but they uh or 1756 maybe I just said 1756 it, I think. it's it 
it's interesting when you see it in the flesh as well it looks slightly different but there's there's there are lots of signatures in the bridge there are some which which look like they might have been of the time and there are others that are a little bit less um well sculpted um and certainly in yeah there, there, there's a whole succession of um nice um graffiti there is also unfortunately some less nice graffiti so in the plaster of room someone in 1978 i think it was uh, has been in there with a little spray can and put their name oh. on it which is really unfair but um and there Richard, are do, do you remove that sort of stuff the spray we, we, can stuff uh, no we won't because no. that's telling its story and um, i think to remove it will, will damage more of the plaster work and more of the things underneath it so when we come to repair these areas and look at them we will if the, if it's stone we'll take the stones out and keep them in situ if we need to replace them but actually most of them are in in fair condition so if, yeah if we go to the next one you'll see that the quality of the stone is great and the quality mm. of this graffiti shall we call this is again fantastic so um and there's lots of bits of of this graffiti of all ages and different styles and different qualities and certainly um in the interwar period there were um residents of the estate have obviously uh, their the various troops have been into the bridge and signed their names so some canadian names in there as well oh, um, right. what we've done at the moment is just recorded um photographically all the all of them and where they are located. So as part of our survey, we, we've recorded that. Um, there are some also some interesting signatures. So going back to the plaster room, which is the next slide, is there to the right hand side of this arch. Unfortunately, I haven't got a close up picture of it at the moment, but there are two signatures above each other in pencil, which have been found in the palace as well. Oh. Uh, so our carpenters have had to do some repair works to some panelling in the palace and where they've taken the panelling off they found these signatures behind it so that also leads me the sort of piecing the puzzle together that in this area there would have been some timber maybe mm. the the cornice would have been timber or or the, the surround to the the doorway so it's interesting linking these together and we've not done any research into it yet but we've recorded and got a yeah got a record of all the signatures in there and and like I said we're not going to remove them. Do you have a date for the you know the one that you said ties in with the signatures in the palace do you have a date for those? They are both dated but I can't remember them but yes <laughs> sure. they are and and they are a couple of years apart so they right. it's definitely um yeah I would imagine that they are carpenters of that age. Oh, interesting. So, interesting. Amazing. We'd love to see if we can find out something about them. Yes. And then track well, down their families and find them. Yes. <laughs> It'd be, yeah, it's really interesting. But that's the thing is that it's, um, yeah, obviously we had craftsmen working at the palace then as we do now. Yeah. So it's, it was, yeah, fantastic. Um, the next image is, uh, is bringing us right up to the modern day. And as part of our survey and exploring the sort of internal condition of the bridge we've had a survey undertaken whilst this looks like a thermal image it's actually a heat map of our laser survey so the areas that are sort of darker colored have only had one or two passes with a a, a laser um, um survey equipment and then as you get brighter is the more passes and the more sort of hits you get so that means we've now got a very true and accurate image of the bridge and means that we can do some fun things with it as in the next slide, which is a sort of video um, X-ray of the bridge. It's a, it's a computer generated image, but you can see the complexity of the depth of structure. So this, mm. you can sort of see each different le level of the bridge and the arches and the, and the sort of interrelationships with the structures that we know and the gaps that we don't but you'll see from that there's a lot of voids mm -hmm. that are even though it's more expensive to fill it in have been filled in can we or, go through that one again richard just to yeah, yeah or have we um are they all voids or are they just areas we don't know yet so this is the very center of the bridge where you can yeah. you, you don't have access through and the sort of lighter colors of areas which you've got access so yes the big big gaps of of space that perhaps they have got um, voids in them or, or perhaps there are other rooms that we get to find. Right. So um, yes, I don't think we'll find them at the moment as we're only scraping the surface, but let's see. But the um, 
technology that they've used to scan the building gives it it put, puts it stone by stone to millimeter accuracy so it's really really detailed information and the next little video looks like it's a, a film um but no, that's in fact, not the right one hold on sorry, sorry. yeah i was looking at the other screen. here we are yeah. <laughs> sorry but this looks like it's a video but actually this is based on all the data so these aren't photographs this is the the laser measures of the bridge so the detail is just phenomenal mm. and this is dropping into the plastered room and then into the area where i said there was a sort of kitchen area perhaps and the thing so we've seen the photographs of that and that but these images are just so close but you see the small crack in the stone to the top left of the arch and yes. in the plaster it's just the detail is fantastic wow um, can we can we run that one through again because again it happens quite quickly just not it let's have a definitely have another walk through so yeah this is a sort of the wandering entrance into the plastered room and yes then you see yes. the Wow. With with just fill underneath our feet as we sat as we stand here. It's yeah, amazing. I mean the bridge is colossal inside and out. You don't realise that it's yeah, at minimum it's 120 metres long. It depends where you start measuring and where you finish measuring, but it's yeah, about 120 metres long, which is right. just massive and three stories. And I keep saying massive, but it just is. It's it it's, is, isn't it? Even for Blenheim scale, it's huge. So it's Great. Um, the next image um, um, shows another one of these survey heat maps. There's um, a stairwell, which is the orangey bit to the left hand side, which was um, known, but the staircase had collapsed. So in my tenure here, I've been at Blenheim four years. Um, we started exploration of the bridge and we put a scaffold into this tower and managed to get down to the ground level um, uh, or yeah, or the, the ground level, which is about the same level as the water level. And then these rooms, you could see an, a little archway with water in it mm. and it just disappeared, but you could hear an echo in there if you splashed on the water. So there's definitely something there. So the survey team, this is the first images we got with long poles, put their equipment into the first chamber. And then it sent a signal along um, and the laser along and we can spot that it's the entire width of the bridge is this other tunnel so perhaps that mirrors the one we've just seen on the other side near the plastered room um, and it, it just, this is an area of the bridge that no one knew existed but is is there and would have been well perhaps it was an access point who knows but we'll we'll explore a bit more when the water drops down isn't it doesn't it make the hair hairs on the back of your neck stand on end to think that you're going into spaces that people haven't been in for hundreds of years yes it's really exciting it's really amazing Fantastic. and one, one one thing we spotted in this image is i don't know whether you see there's a sort of dark void but after the first bit of green there's a, a structure that sort of goes this way across the image yeah that one that one. That, that is the crown of the top of an arch oh right with then the water level so we've um, explored where the cursor is now and actually under the water level in one of the tunnels of one of the arches of the bridge, you can see that there's another arch going across that way under, under the water. Okay. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't go very far. It goes, I don't know, about 10 feet in and then stops and it's, it's bricked up and it's a solid structure. We know this because um, we've yeah, visited the, the bridge with, um, uh, before um, President Trump visited Blenheim, a lot of Blenheim was searched by the police and I have spent two days in the bridge with the police searching and um, some of the, their underwater cameras, we delved into places we hadn't been before as well. So that's how we know that that doesn't extend any further. So, yes, we're using every resource we can when, when available. Yes. <laughs> that's a lot about how we've got the data and got got to know what the bridge is like now but yeah the wants of repair we've um we've known or blenheim have known for a number of years that there's water percolating into the structure and mm -hmm. causing a few problems so the works that are going on at the moment are the sort of first initial stages the sort of prevention stages so we're going to provide a better waterproofing um to the top of the bridge which also if we go to the next slide will also provide um 
rather than such a large expanse of tarmac will also provide um, some paving areas and will grass it. So the red lines at the bottom sort of indicate the areas that we're going to provide this, uh, provide a waterproofing layer. Yep. It's in the words of the conservation officer, a, a nasty plastic um, membrane, but oh they, it serves its purpose. It's going to look after the, the historic fabric and it's not going to detract from what's underneath it. It's just going to protect the bridge. So the first phase and, the f and is to is to get the water, keep the water out and give it a route to go. So they'll, so akin to the great um, court, there will be um, surface gullies which are the darker lines either side of the road to oh, yeah. basically move the water away and keep it away from the bridge um, and from the structure. And then underneath that, we'll have this membrane just to look after it. So anyone who's been to site recently will have seen that um, the membrane's gone down um, on the um, park farm side, the, the um, southern side of the bridge. And they're starting to rebuild and, and relayer up to, to do these... Um, to do the paving and the um, the tarmacking eventually. So, excuse me a second. I'm I'm obviously talking too much and too quickly. Oh but, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. Um, but yeah, so so this is the first stage. We'll do, we'll do these repairs, and then we can look at the stone of the bridge mm -hmm. um, throughout. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah. During the excavations, and um, this is actually a trial excavation, we found the historic um, waterproofing system that was used, which is not a nasty membrane. It is um, a thick layer of clay with some the red clay tiles on top, and they were all embedded in clay, and it had a clay... Um, um, cover over the top. We've exposed this, we've looked at it, and we've recorded it for um, with an archaeologist. And then we've we've reapplied the clay and covered it over. And the new membrane and new new system will go over the top of this. So preserving the historic fabric, yet protecting it as well. Um, and we on top of the membrane, Richard. Um, it's um, a, a just a it's a sort of standard roadway or um, okay. or um, pathway build up. So aggregates and sand and, and then paving and tarmac over the road area. So if you go to the next image, this is actually as work started. So the contractor on site has scraped it off. And we found that this is a fairly complete layer of um, of the the tiles. Um, so we expanded that. Um, um, initial excavation but you see it's got a very distinct edge to mm -hmm. it and I, I know that on that edge is an area where we've got water in the bridge oh, right. it's covering over all of this will protect the bridge structure internally and keep it here for another 300 years hopefully. How, how far down was this original um, surface um, roughly? Is um, that's a very, feet or? Yes I mean it's a couple of feet a, a foot and a half to two feet down so it's yeah, it, it's down and under. And I'm pretty sure the sort of surface level of the tarmac where these people are stood, I'm mm -hmm. sure that level has changed over time, gone up and down yes. a bit and, and moved around. Um, we're increasing the height of that ever so slightly in the centre, but at the edges it will be it will remain the same. But the reason we're increasing the height is to make sure that we can get the fall on the tarmac and make sure mm -hmm. we can shed water um, away from the bridge structure. Yes. So there you go. So we're currently in stage one of the deck project, mm -hmm. um, and that's due to that's luckily we've had some heritage um, funding for this, and that's the, this phase is due to finish in um, end of this month, right. and next month we will continue and start towards the south of the bridge, a bit closer to the palace. So we've just done this first half that's mm -hmm. sort of the foreground, and the the other half will follow on very soon. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's a very exciting project because this is the start of protecting the bridge. It's, it's really fantastic. How long um, do you think it will, how long would it take you to, to protect the whole bridge? You know, as you say, if this is just phase one or phase A. Yes, it's always, um, it's very difficult to, to quantify. We've, um, with the surveys, we've, we've put some packages together. So if we can go to the next slide, splitting the projects in the 
the bridge intersections we can look at it as each project so to the right hand side so the northeast side there's um the yellow section and red section have been costed for stonework repairs mm -hmm. and that is that's probably about eight months work for a medium-sized stonework or masonry contractor so we're sort of looking at splitting it into five or six more phases afterwards so sort of five or six more years maybe or maybe we can do a couple of phases together but we want to do this first section of stonework after we've done the deck so that we can find out how the bridge is constructed we've done as much investigation as we can but you never quite know until you've got it scaffolded and and you're taking stones out to replace them that you you'll then find out how it's actually constructed and then it'll give us a better idea of how long things will take and how expensive they will be going forward does it um, doesn't it terrify you the sort of taking out these blocks of stone um yes it does <laughs> good yeah. i'm glad <laughs> the the bit that concerns me most is the loss of historic fabric and we only take out areas that we have to to protect the sort of the, the main structure but you're never worried that you know you'll take out a crucial bit and the whole lot will come tumbling down um a little concerned but we have um structural engineers the contractors used are are very good and we all have a sort of basic understanding of how the structure is put together it's just a sort of fine details and certainly when we come to the the stones of the arches mm -hmm. we'll only ever remove one at a time and we'll remove half at a time or bits at a time just to make sure that there's that structural integrity is there um, it's a very complex and very difficult thing to do because you're not entirely sure which bits are under load and which bits aren't until you start start with them and then we're at the hands of the contractor to and their expertise to know whether it's a, a structure that's been um, yeah is it, as a stone that's under stress or mm. or not um, we learned quite a few lessons we've recently undertaken um, quite a lot of work at Bladen Bridge and although it's a far um, smaller bridge a lot of the things we've learned from that will bring into this mm -hmm. as we work through excellent excellent gosh so very exciting times ahead oh massively so um and and slightly nervy times yeah. as well but um the next image is is of this quadrant is the sort of we go to the architects look at it stone by stone as to which ones need replacing, which ones are a maybe, and what works need to happen. So we have got a fairly good idea, but it's still a fairly complex process. But um, as we were talking before about logistics um, and moving stone in for the original construction, we have the same issue here is that we've got to move stones, the coping stones along the, um, the wall there, the, the, there's some large ones that need to be replaced, but we need to somehow and safely lift them off and somehow safely and gently put the new ones in and make sure they stay there so everything has got an engineering um uh, yeah it uh, needs an engineering solution as well as an architectural solution um there are patches of the wall which shown in sort of light dusky pink here mm -hmm. where where we suspect once you start replacing the odd stone here and there we might have sort of small scale collapses or mm. areas that are sort of more coming apart because with the bridge different corners are weathering differently so whilst this side is fairly intact the other side if you look at it above the water which is the palace side but to the east um is has got some quite large gaps in the stone where there have been rock falls before so we know that um yeah there is a little bit of damage there but we also know that this section has been repaired a little bit in the past um and yes we now need to do a wholesale repair and richard is and again forgive forgive my ignorance really um I'm assuming it's not dry stone walling, that you, there has been mortar or whatever used in the past. And if so, yeah. do, do we then use the same sort of mix as far as we can or you know, what, what happens? Uh, absolutely. So a lot of it is, is lime-based mortars. Right. 
um, with local stone aggregates. So we not only do we match the sort of the the, the line, we we will first of all take away cement repairs which have been done in the past, which is quite common and it was of its time. But um, we've since learned that this new the, the sort of it's better to use the lime mortars for longevity. Um, and whilst we don't have dry stone walls in it, we do have this coarse rubble stone and then very neatly cut ashlar stone. Yeah. So, so the mortar will be different for each application and different um, quantities of fine aggregate to slightly coarser aggregate and the lime strengths will be different as well for the right situation. Um, again, it's, it's hugely complicated, but, but very simple for those who, those specialist contractors who do this all the yeah. time and certainly the work we've done on the palace with the ashlar stone it'll be the same so it will take lessons we've learned around the around the estate and also the architects are, are work, working all over the country so we make sure we're up to sort of speed with the current um uh, understanding of how um all the materials perform mm -hmm. yeah, being true being true to the structure as well so yeah a lot of it will be using old techniques um, which, which is yeah it's just fantastic and it's just a lot of it the bridge is lots of it <laughs> there is isn't there <laughs> it definitely is and um, Richard can I just interrupt for a moment so we, we have a, an online audience which is wonderful and um, I'd just like to invite people if if they would like to ask any questions then you have this lovely Q&A facility so please do use it or you have a chat facility as well, so use that, because Richard would love to answer your questions, wouldn't you, Richard? I certainly would, it, it helps, yeah, <laughs> helps with ensuring we get the right content, but it's, because um, it's, it, it's a, yeah, it's a very interesting and yeah. a very unique setting, in the, and I think people are quite interested, so it's, it's nice having people um, looking at the interpretation we've got up for the work at the moment, and and um, talking to people. So yes, definitely welcome questions. Thank you. Right, so um, we have, I think, one final little voyage into the bridge. Richard, is that right? We, we do. Um, this little video is, again, based on, on the 3D survey data. And the, it just gives you an idea of what space we know about and what space we don't know about within the bridge. Okay, let's go. So you'll see this is sort of diving into the structure. All this sort of the, the buff colored is are the tunnels that we know about or the rooms we know about. But all this space, which is free, is areas that we don't know about yet. Wow. Um, is that the curve of the main central arch? It is, yes. Yeah. So we, we've sat on one, on one of the side arches here. Um, as we've dropped down through it. So yeah, these are the chambers that I was sort of saying that you can get access to, and you can probably make out the, um, almost in the center of the screens, the underside of some steps. Oh and yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah. The, yeah. That, that's um, um, yeah, a step way down towards the um, main arch that we use when we're in the bridge. So gosh, yeah. Shall I run that again? I think that again, that's, that's such, such a wonderful thing. Wow. It is, it's, it's interesting and it's very interesting. I, I, I appreciate it, I'm completely spoiled because I'm, uh, I'm allowed in here under the watchful eye of the ecologists. But... Lucy said I was allowed in there too. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people have told me that as well. But no, unfortunately it's not something we're going to be able to open to the public or open to mass visits. We're only doing it where, where necessary and where where we um, need to investigate a bit more yeah. um, for the project. So, yeah, it's an exclusive club, I'm afraid, that's been that's allowed into the bridge. <laughs> well, Richard, we, we don't have any questions, so we're going to let you off very, very lightly. But I have to say that was absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I, I just can't wait to be allowed into the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> we will try, but uh, yes, we'll, we'll see. And when, when is it going to open again? When will it um, be accessible? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer and I, I don't have an exact answer okay. to that. I think um, 
uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, we should be able to open it to pedestrians okay. to, walk, to walk again. But there'll be works continuing until the end of the month. And then, unfortunately, there'll be another um, interruption to people's enjoyment of walking over the bridge um, in the next few months because we'll need to do the, the work to the southern side. Okay. Um, I don't have the timings for that at the moment, but we'll let people know through, I think, social media and, and we'll post at every gate as well just to make sure people, yeah, whilst it's very inconvenient if you're on a walk and you find the bridge closed, it is a very short period of time within the life of the bridge. So, exactly. And unfortunately, it is very necessary. So once we're done, it will be for quiet enjoyment there on. So, yeah, and, and for future generations. Well, Richard, that, as I say, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and you know, come and talk to us again in, in a few months' time. Let us know what you found, because I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll find all sorts of wonderful things, and some of them probably a little bit gory even. I'm not sure. Who knows? There's always stories, aren't there? And always yes, stories. Always. Uh, some folklore is coming to... Come coming together with finding the stone of Woodstock Manor in the bridge, but maybe some of the others will come true, but we'll see. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank right. so thank you, and um, see you again soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.